If you know where a valley called Chapel Dale is, just wave at me. Okay. One or two didn't wave. Does that mean that those who didn't wave don't know where it is? No. You don't know where it is? Oh, okay. Those who didn't put their hands up and who weren't too shy to put their hands up are actually in good company because I don't know where a valley called Chapel of Dale is either because there's no such thing as the valley Chapel of Dale and I've put my title deliberately phrased it in the valley of Chapel of Dale Chapel of Dale is the settlement by the church not the valley right that's uh, that's the first factoid for tonight if you went there and asked a local what do you call this valley and assuming he didn't think you were a tourist in which case you would just say Chapel of Dale if he thought you were if you went there with a pair of muddy boots and a pair of rubber farmers what's it he'd tell you or she'd tell you we just called it the Dale historically it was Weasdale or Wisedale and that there are various spellings of that and if you've ever looked at the OS map when you've been there or just looked at the OS map there are two rivers aren't there that come down either side of Wernside and finish up in the greeter at Ingleton one is called the Doe and one is called the Twist and according to the Ordnance Survey map the one that comes from Chapel of Dale following the, the main road is the River Doe and the one that goes around the back coming out sort of Kingsdale-ish is the Twist. No, that's wrong. The Doe is the other one and the one that comes from Chapel of Dale following the main road is the Twist. And the Ordnance Survey have been told this by various organisations and people over the years and they will not change it. But twists and wheeze, you can see that they've got a sort of a common derivation. There's no common derivation between wheeze and dough. There's a part of the dale, if you go from the hill in, just down below the hill in, and turn right up the, the road that goes up to Brunscar, the one that millions of uh, three peakers come down every weekend, you go past a farm, you go through a farm called Philpin. And that part of the dale is called, or was called in the past, Philpindale. That's P-H, Philpindale. So, Chapel de Dale is the settlement, not the valley. And let's see whether this works. Ah. So, um, those of you who are watching this, possibly later on in YouTube, I'm afraid I'm going to be using a pointer, but I hope that thing will pick it up. The... Can you see that red dot? Yep. That thing I've got uh, in there, that is Scales Moor, which is a, a huge area of limestone pavement with quite a bit of um, glacial till veneer. That is Chapel of Dale. There's the summit of Wernside. There's the summit of Ingleborough. This is the B6255 coming from Ribblehead down to Ingleton. So Philpindale is this bit here. And the dale starts at Ribblehead and comes all the way down to Twizzleton which is about just about there okay so I've got that sorted so the, those are the spellings at different times of its original name first one there a mixture of uh, French and English which is, was quite common in the records 1595 it was being spelt that way wires got an R in it for some reason then it got, went back 1611 changed and I'll show you a, a copy of a map later on dating 1755 which actually says the river Wees on it and then I've, I've already mentioned about the twists and the dough that's a view looking northwest that up there is the summit of Wernside just popping out there this is the river Doe, twist. 
you've got the scales more is on that level there. That's the, it's, it's a very pretty level right across one end to end and side to side. And the landscape comes down in a series of limestone scars. So everything from, in fact, you've got in this picture here, you've got most of the geological succession in this part of the Dales. You've got the millstone grit capping Wernside. Then you've got the Yordale sequence, the alternating limestones and sandstones with occasional shale bands. Then you've got the Carboniferous, the Great Scar limestone, which comes all the way down to here. There's one or two limestone bits sticking out. This area across here is masking the limestone. That's some glacial dump, glacial till. But right down in the valley bottom here, it's right down way below the Carboniferous. There's no Silurian in the valley. It's long since been worn away. But what you've got here is very early Ordovician strata, what geologists call grey wacky. And if you've ever seen grey wacky, it's green. I don't know why it's not called green wacky. In terms of um, vegetation, you can see the, the scar is, is, it's not, you wouldn't call it thickly wooded. It's what in the past was called wood pasture. And it was a, wood pasture was a managed landscape. You had small trees, bushes, hawthorns, blackthorns, alders if in the wetter parts, hazel, with occasional taller trees sticking out, and then open grassland. And you, the, the cattle were just allowed to, to wander around in there. And a wood pasture provided not just grazing, but also browsing. Because if you've ever seen cattle leaning over walls, knocking the walls down quite often to get at the, the browse just over that wall, well, there they didn't need to do that. So it's, it's a, there's not that many areas in the Dales where wood pasture still survives. But it, it does here, and not just here, on the other side of the valley as well. That's a Google Earth image. The yellow line coming down here is the B6255. This is Chapel of Dale there. The Oddis Lane is coming along here. And one of those is the line of the Roman roads, but no, nobody can agree which one. Scales more up here. And the whiter areas are where you've got limestone pavement exposed. The, the ridge coming down from Wernside, coming down here, and then down into Kingsdale, right at the top left of the, of the image there. And you can see, particularly on the Ingleborough side, you've got very, very clear terracing there where, where major beds have sort of stepped down. And you've got the same thing on the other side, but because of the, the angle that this image was taken and the light, it's, it's not as clear on that side there as it, as it is here. But if you stand on the, uh, the road just above the hill in, where the, the road drops down and look down the valley, it's one of the best examples in outside the Lake District in England of a classic U-shaped glacial valley. That's below the hill in. So the top of the limestone here and the top of the limestone here, that is the, the land surface before the first glaciation millions of years ago. So it is a, it's a special landscape geologically and botanically and in terms of glaciology as well. Scales Moor, which I had dotted on my uh, location map, is, or was rather, not part of Ingleton Parish, not part of the manor of Ingleton. It was part of a separate manor called Twizleton and Ella Beck. It was quite separate. And the earliest record from, from about 1200, this is in the, the, the Furness Abbey um, charters, the landowner then, de Twistleton, de Twistleton, he was a subtenant of the manor, Twistleton and Ellerbeck, 
and the manor, it states in this charter that the manor, the area of the manor was mele acris more et pasture. Again, a nice mix of Latin with a little bit of uh, English stuck on the end there. And you'll all be experts, I'm sure, in Latin. A thousand acres of moor and pasture. The tithe apportionment in the 1840s stated the area of the parish as 1,018 acres. And the Commons Registration Act, when all commons had to be registered to keep them to maintain their common status in 2006, that with the, you know, the most accurate measurement methods we've got now, measured it at 1,022. So, you know, way back in 1,200, for them to have known it was 1,000 acres, you think, well, what... What were they using to measure something so big, so accurately? That is a map from uh, GPS. So we've got the... Must be light. I can't see it. I've got the road coming down here, the B road, the river coming down there, this one here is Oddie's Lane. These three purple lines are the, the three scars. Above that, up here, that scales more. This area here is called scales. And there are, there are three, what were farms, high scales, scale scottage or middle scales, it was sometimes called, and low scales. They're no longer farms, but they're still lived in. And up at the top there, another one, X farm, but still lived in Gill Head. Chapel of Dale down here. All these green lines are field banks. The ones down here, below the lower scar, some of them crossing the B road, these are, all, all, I think there's 15 or 16 of them, with a few head banks. These relate to a probable, nobody knows for certain, but a probable Iron Age or Roman Iron Age site that was here but has been ploughed out. The ones up here on the first terrace, again just parallel, these relate to two farmsteads, one farmstead there and one farmstead there, which we excavated back in uh, 2012, and both of them came up with dates firmly from the Anglo-Saxon period. So we've got a, a late prehistoric, possibly early historic field system down here, and then an early medieval field system higher up. So why... If you're on, if you're on uh, YouTube later on, Y is the Anglo-Saxon period field systems and X is the late prehistoric field system and the star is where the ploughed out settlement was. You can see bits of it from high up in, in, depending on the light, but nothing like um, what used to be there. That's a view looking southwest. You can see the scars more clearly. A bit of a dark photo, but I've got this on because you've got, it just shows these banks. There's three of, the, three of those banks, the, the late prehistoric banks coming along here with a head bank running along there. You can go there, probably even if you went there now, you wouldn't see them very clearly because of the vegetation, but you go there in, particularly after Christmas, between January and, and late April, they stand out very clearly like they do there. And again, you can perhaps see the, the nature of the wood pasture scattered all down the scars. A close-up Google Earth image. High scales, scale cottage or middle scales and low scales, gill head up there. The wood pasture, the remnants of the wood pasture. If you look in that area 
and see how many straight walls you can find. I think you'll find two. One coming along here and doing a dog leg. One here, and it's, it did go up there, but it's been robbed out. All the rest of those walls are anything but straight. And I think that is one of the, to me, most aesthetically pleasing examples of a, of a landscape, a fieldscape, that's grown organically. It's not been planned, you know, like the enclosure landscapes with these dead straight walls marching up the fell sides and everything, every, every wall junction at a right angle. This is a landscape that's grown organically. It's grown piecemeal. They've spread out generationally, making a new assart or clearing in the woodland to make prime pasture land or going back far enough into the Anglo-Saxon period, certainly, prime arable land, prime cropland. And you can see this field here sort of just, boom, you know, it's a crazy shape, isn't it? Absolutely crazy shape. But they've obviously just sort of gone out a bit further. And this one here, this bulbous projection here, and this, this weird one up here, they've just sort of gone a bit further and a bit further and a bit further. And then coming down here, you've got um, a funnel, coming off the moor. That wall blocking it off is relatively modern, but that funnel came all the way down to low scales and middle scales, so the stock could get up onto the open moor. And there's a shorter one here coming out of high scales, again onto the open moor. The, th the arrows, these two arrows, you can probably make that one out, but you may not be able to make that one out. But these are absolutely massive clearance cairns. Absolutely massive. And this arrow up here, there's a wall coming down here, which at the top is just over a metre wide. At the top. That's obviously... A linear clearance cairn, a.k.a. a wall. Because why did walls start? They were clearing the stone out of the way. The, this is scales more. All these little hollows, they're not bomb craters. Those are little shake holes because you've got the veneer of glacial till and collapsed below, and these are all a massive little shake holes. This area here, which is grey, that's an, an area of exposed limestone pavement. There's another one there and a bit more there. And um, I don't know whether you can see, but there's this L-shaped field here, and just there, can you make out a, a semicircular line? I've got a picture of this coming up later on. It, it's a little enclosure within an enclosure, and on, in that wall there, there's a structure that's truncated by the later wall that looks to me very much like one of the Anglo-Saxon buildings that we've um, been looking at all round Ingleborough since 2008. So it's a very complex landscape, indeed, geologically as well as in terms of land management. That is Ellebeck Farm. This is Ellebeck. And the Scales Farms are down here. That arrow there is pointing to where a channel, a ditch, taps the water or tapped the water from Ellebeck and brought it all the way down across there and all the way down to the farms. That's part of it. These scales, when they appear, each section is half a metre. So that's a bit where they've just cut a fairly narrow, fairly shallow channel. But here, because there's a, a, a heap, a big heap of glacial till in the way, they've actually dug a really deep channel to get through there. And it's elite. And I, I did some work on 
these around Inglebrod two years ago, I think it was, and I found six of varying lengths. This one was bringing water from Ellerbeck to middle scales and low scales. And I've measured each of these six. I surveyed them from start to finish. I calculated the gradient, the overall gradient, and the gradient of different sections. And they're absolutely stunning. They were designed so that the water would flow, but not too quickly, that it would, you know, gouge and gully. But they were just water supply. And all but one of them, in my, to my mind, are medieval. And you think, you know, they, what would they have had? Wooden spades. Just wooden spades to dig these things. You know, they... The, a bit like the railways, just mind-boggling scale of operation. And it would have been the farmers who just did it and got, you know, got everybody together. Or if it was on monastic land, then presumably the, the abbey organised it. But they're just phenomenal. That's looking across high scales is there. That's middle scale, scales cottage which is the biggest by far, and hiding behind those trees is low scales. Can you see a line going across there? That's a hollow way. It's a sunken track way. And where it goes through the wall there, there's no indication in the wall that there was ever a way through. So that trackway had gone out of use before that wall was built. And it comes up here, and when it gets to that point, it opens out as a kind of funnel. And underneath the trees there, there's the remains of another farmstead. So we've got four farmsteads, three still inhabited, this one just reduced to a pile of ruins. So we've got, we've got just in that picture there, we've got a multi-period landscape. And then the bulk of Wernside beyond. This is above the wall. There's the, you can see the, the hollow way, the line of it there. Um, that, again, a metre. Absolutely no indication that there's ever been wall heads and a way through. This is it below the wall, and I hope you can see that's been cut away into the rock. The ranging pole is in the concavity of the hollow way, and then you've got the convexity of the bank on the side there. So it's absolutely dead straight hollow way coming up from below. And I suspect that is Anglo-Saxon period in origin. So when you get to the top of that hollow way, come through the funnel, you've got the, the series of earthworks along here and there's some more on the other side. And this wall, it's not a field wall, this is part of the surviving back wall or north wall of this range of buildings. It's, uh, I'd love to get in there with, a, with a, well, more than a trowel, but I doubt that that will happen. That's the plan of it. So the wall you were just looking at is that wall there. So there are five cells along that, in that range, and then there is two, possibly three, on this side. Here's the hollow way coming up. Here's the funnel. You've got uh, relic walls there, relic walls going around the top, uh, stone banks, where you can see where there have been walls. It was obviously quite a substantial farmstead. And absolutely nothing is known about it. There's no mention at all in any record that I've been able to find. But you've got the scale there, 10 metres. You know, it, it's, it's a long, that was a long range. What, 30 metres? Probably that, about that bit more, about 30 metres each side. Really substantial. Now, I've mentioned the word scales about a thousand times already. 
most stuff that you read says that scales derives from an old Norse word, scarly, which means a shealing, a summer, um, temporary summer hut and enclosures where they took the sheep and the cattle up for the summer away from the, you know, to give the, the land down by their farmstead, down by the settlement, chance to recover. But why, especially given all the results of the archaeology we've done over the past 13, 14 years, why is it automatically assumed that it's an old word, an old Norse word? It's this thing that annoys me, that, oh, it's Viking, it's got to be Viking. The Dales was full of Vikings. Well, not according to the evidence from all the work we've been doing over the last number of years. So why can't scales derive from another word, old English word, shela, which means the same thing? SC in Old English is a sh. Twistleton is another Old English word. The ton just means a place or a farmstead or a small settlement. The twizzle bit comes from Twistler, which is a river fork, uh, presumably with a doe and the twist, or the twist and the doe, whichever way they're supposed to be. I'm going to come back to place names uh, because they are an important. They add an important little bit to the story of, of interpreting a landscape like this. And not just this, but obviously landscapes anywhere in, in the Dales and beyond. So that's the shot you had earlier. This is it mapped. Each of the fields has a number. There are 40 numbered fields there. And about 10 years ago... Um, I started doing just a, I just started on my own just for the, just for the hell of it. And then Alison, my partner Alison, joined in and we surveyed every single wall from start to finish. Photographed, measured, took notes, trying to build up a chronology of walls. In, in the, all the fields that are numbered there, five of them have got close in the name of the field. One has got copy. There are three intacts, two garths, ten parrocks, and two pants. All of those words are old words. Close is an, an, an early word for enclosure. Copy, sometimes spelt with a P. Uh, sorry, sometimes spelt with two P's, I mean, can either mean coppice, or again, it can just be another word for an enclosure. Intac, which is, a, which is an Old Norse word, is, the other word is inby. I think you know what inby is if you don't know the word intac. Garth is just an enclosure close to the farmstead. Parrock is an old word for paddock, and pant, two pants. We've got pants and low pant. <coughs> if you've, I'm sure you have, been to Wales, driving along the roads in Wales, and if you're not looking at your smartphone all the time, if you're not driving, there are road signs. In England, if the road goes down and comes back up again, and there's, you don't get to see what's down there to be going down there, the road sign will say hidden dip. In Welsh, it's pant kith. So the word pant is still used in modern Welsh. It means a hollow or a dip, something like that. Or a, or a valley in modern Welsh, it's a survival of the old Britonic, the Celtic language that was spoken here, you know, long before the Anglo Saxons or anybody else rolled up on the scene. And in this case, if you know Ostwick, there's Pant Lane in Ostwick, which goes down into a hollow. 
So you've got a fantastic snapshot of, of different periods way back in, in history from the place names, from the field place names. That's Scales Cottage or Middle Scales, about 1900. It's a heck of a big house, but you, it's, that's the core of the house. There's a straight joint there and a straight joint there. They've tagged a bit on there, they've tagged a bit on there, they've tagged a bit more on there, they've tagged a bit more on there. I don't know why it's called Scales Cottage, because it's about twice as big as the other two which aren't called Cottage. But um, it was a farm, it's been obviously, you know, tarted up in recent years. And that was middle scales in the 1930s, when it was, it was derelict for a long time, but again it's been tarted up. Um, you can see a change in the roof there, so the, the ship and the barn has been added on to the house, an outshot added on with a dairy presumably, and a stair maybe, external chimney stack. It's a wonderful house. Can you read that? Can you all read that? Oh, I, I hate reading things off a screen. I've just taken a, a five-year period, 1608 to 1613, to show from various documentary sources in the last column there, to show the names of the families who were resident at Scales in that five-year period. And sometimes, a lot of times, more often than not, parish records are infuriating because they don't say exactly where the person lived. A lot of them they just say Ingleton or Horton, so it could be absolutely anywhere. Um, but these all say in different spellings, they just say scales. Is that high scales, low scales, middle scales, or the other one that, that uh, we don't know anything about? But the interesting thing there, if you look down the list of names in that five-year period, <coughs> three, possibly four farmsteads, if we include the one that's now gone, but there are more than four family names there. Is it five or six? One, two, three. Three, four, five, six, seven, seven. All living up there. That's just a, just one five-year period. So it was, a, it was a busy place. Gillhead, which I haven't mentioned, which is on the track. If you go on the track from Chapel of Dale Church up to Ellerbeck and then up um, wherever you want to go from, from Ellerbeck. You, you go past Gillhead and it's like many houses in the Dales. You look at it as you walk past in uh, 18th century or early 19th century. But when you start looking at it in detail, as we did, the, the owners, this would be I think 20, 2012, yeah, the owners, because I went there to ask permission to look at their walls on the land that they owned when we were doing the wall survey. And they asked um, if we would do a survey of the house. So Alison and I did it, and these are some of Alison's wonderful drawings. There's all sorts of indicators there of a much, much earlier house. There are reused timbers, there's a, a massive chimney stack with the, you know, the, the um, walking, quote unquote, walking fireplace, mullion windows. Um, a plinth, raised roof lines. It's a much, much earlier house than what you'd think if you just walked past it now. And associated with the house is a barn. And it's an, I've not seen a barn like this anywhere. The Shippen is entered, the Shippen and the, the Mew is entered through these two doors on the ground floor. That would be a mucking out window, that's just a window window. That presumably was a forking hole, and then there's a ramp going up there to the first floor, which was the mew, where they kept the hay. But what on earth is that all about? There's no way they could have got the hay up there. It's just, I don't know, it's just, and when you go inside onto the first floor, it's just, it's just staggering. Absolutely staggering size. And we couldn't, Alison and I, we just couldn't fathom it out. Why on earth was it built so high? It 
each of the black blobs on there are farmsteads which were I'm using the word farmstead generically which were possessions of Furness Abbey and this dotted line is the boundary of the monastic estate coming this way was not monastic land but they owned everything from here right up past Ribblehead to Newby Head all the way down nearly to Horton and, and Selside as well as around Newby and Clapham and right up to the Lancashire border um, in Boland and the, these were all place names, settlement names in the charters of Furness Abbey and you may, like me, grew up being told that, that the monasteries were granted land out in the sticks by landowners who wanted prayers said in perpetuity just, you know, for their own salvation and that the land was granted. For Souther Scales, which was from the Souther Scales estate, which was from this dotted line along this dotted line up to about here, and coming across there. So this area here, which is just less than a quarter of what they had around the northern side of Ingleborough, Furness Abbey paid £600 for it. Now £600 in the 12th century was one heck of a lot of money. Goodness knows, hundreds of thousands of pounds in, in, in modern currency. And they did not. The work we did at Thorns under stories in stone it was pretty obvious that when Furness Abbey bought this, they were not buying a desert, a wilderness. They were buying a already managed landscape, an already managed fieldscape. And the, <coughs> there was a hierarchy of, of farms, highest at the top, going down to the bottom. Vacaria, or vaccaries, cattle estates. Cattle estates, or if you like, cowboys, ranches. There were originally three. Souter Scales, Souther Scales. Querny Side, Wern Side, which was later called Winter Scales. Selseth, Selside. And later on, they added a fourth. They, they subdivided and added a fourth, Burbladewith, which is centred on Low Burkwith. So that was the top, if you like. So there were four, that whole area around the north of England was split into four vaccaries, four cattle estates, each managed separately from the abbey. And then there were burkaries, burkaria, sheep estates. And there is a house just on the edge of Chapel of Dale, just above Chapel of Dale, called Weathercut, which is spelt today like weather, as in it's raining. But historically, it was not weather as in weather, but weather as in weather, a castrated male sheep, a weather coat. In the language in, in, in Old English, weather cot, a weather cot, which translates as a sheep shed or a sheep house. Then below that, there were the logier, the lodges, and the two obvious ones which are, uh, are known is Lodge Hall, up towards Ribble Head and Nether Lodge on the other side of the Ribble, on the east side of the Ribble. The problem with the word log here is a lodge could be anything from basically a shed up to something quite substantial. And then there were stud farms, Colt Park was the Colt, was the stud farm for Furness Abbey. And if, and if you know Ribblesdale, further down, you go past Elwith Bridge and you get to Studfold. Well, Studfold was the Studfold for Jervo Abbey, its Ribblesdale estates. And then you get, at the bottom of the, of the hierarchy, you get the lesser holdings like Thorns, Ashes, South House, which were not individual farms, they were collections of farms. So Thorns, for example, that was, was six, made up of six farms. South House, I think, was that four or I think that was, no, it was four, made up of four they weren't just individual places. The names back then referred to areas rather than specific spots. So you get this wonderful hierarchy, which is still visible 
in the landscape. And one thing, and it's not just in, in this area, if you find a farm today which is a substantial farm, substantial in terms of the buildings at the farmstead and in the area that it's farming, you can bet your bottom dollar that those farms were originally monastic properties. There's a very strong correlation between the two. So in the post-dissolution um, valuation that was done of Furness Estates, 1538-39 financial year, there were 13 discrete properties, each with multiple tenancies. So you're looking at not 13 farms, but 13 times four or times six farmsteads. And out of the whole of Furness Abbey's Lonsdale properties around Ingleborough, north and south, and across to the Lancashire border, Southern Scales was the most uh, valuable of, of all the 19 properties listed in 1536-37. Southern Scales was number one. We did a project there under Stories in Stone, um, archaeological project there as well, which you may have heard about. Did I talk about it? I can't remember. Have I talked to, have I talked to you about that, Southern Scales? I can't remember. The dominant surnames in the late monastic period are those there. What I heard, Proctor, Falscroft, Sigswick, Bentham and Moore. A Proctor, that comes from a Latin word, and a Proctor was somebody who went round from tenement to tenement collecting the rent. In this case for the abbey, or in other cases for the you know, the, the, the lord of the manor. The names today, Weatherhead, Proctor, this, just in ER, Falscroft has become Foxcroft, there's still Foxcrofts around Settle, Sedgwick, still Sedgwick's around Settle, Bentham and Moore. I don't know any Weatherheads still around Settle, but there might be in other parts of the day, as I don't know. <coughs> The bits sort of south of that line on my earlier map that weren't monastic property, that were under seigneurial control, I've just picked out three little bits there. So the 1251, this is in one of the Furness Abbey documents because the, the landowner who sold the land or whose ancestor sold the land to Furness, Alice, Alice de Staveley, she wrote in 1251, it was her father, who, who, or maybe even her grandfather, who sold it. But she, this is in, in one uh, of the charters. How's your Latin? If my demean cattle, in other words, the cattle that belong to me, or my men who live in the rocks of Weasdale, which is called Scales. So this tells us that in 1251, there were people living there in the rocks on the scars at Scales, and that she was claiming, even though she'd sold the land across there to Furness Abbey, she was claiming, she was stating clearly her claim that my cattle and my men have got the rights to be there and to do what my men do with those cattle. She's obviously very, um, uh, what's the right word, a, a determined um, person. Then in jumping another few decades, 1297, Elias de Scales, he had two cows, two animali uniora, that's small animals, calves probably, 20 sheep, a bigot of hay, a bigot was a cartload. But don't ask me how big a bigot was, because I don't know how big a bigot was. And the total value of all that was 21 shillings and sixpence, which was a lot of money. That was a lot of money. And then jumping forward another 80 years or so, the 1378-79 the um, poll tax records, again, it's, it's very difficult to pin people down to precise places. But those four are the only ones I can pin out of Ingleton's poll tax that I can pin down to scales. So William of scales, 
Oh, and his wife. John, son of William. Oh, and his wife. Thomas of Ellerbeck. Oh, and Hannah's wife. And then one of my distant ancestors, Thomas Johnson, who was obviously a servant of uh, somebody called Weatherherd. Probably a farm servant rather than a, a house servant. Going back to the wall survey that we did in 2011-2012, uh, this map on the left, there are red walls and there are blue walls, which I classified as type 1, the red, and type 2, the blue. Those are all, in my opinion, and Alison agreed with me when we were doing it, those are all medieval walls. So the majority of walls, if you look at the, how many are coloured on the first map and the second map, the majority of, of the walls up there are medieval from wherever you want to put them in that medieval period. The map on the right there, red walls and green walls, type 3 and type 4 walls, the type 4 walls, the green walls, those are what I call hybrid walls. They've been mucked around and rebuilt and, and modified so many times They've got elements of old walls, but they've got elements of new walls, so I just call them hybrid. The red walls, which are all tightly associated with high scales, in the 1930s, I've forgotten his name, but um, somebody took on the tenancy of high scales, not as a farm, but just as somewhere to live. And the landowner said he could live there rent-free, if he rebuilt all the walls. And the red walls are the walls that he rebuilt. I'll show you, there's a, I've got a picture coming up. He did a magnificent job. There are not many studies have been done in this detail, on this scale of landscape, looking at walls. I'm, I'm quite proud of that. There's two type 1 walls, again with the 1 metre scales. <coughs> this one, well both of them, there's, there's absolutely no hint of regular coursing of the, of the stones. There's no hint of grading from bigger stones at the bottom to smaller stones at the top. You won't find any through stones, you know the big ones are going right through the wall where the walls have collapsed, you'll struggle to find any fillers, any little stones in the middle. They are straight-sided. They can be anything up to, these are not particularly high, but they can be anything up to 1.8 or 2 metres high, straight-sided and flat-topped. Those are both clearly medieval walls. And, and this one down here, these huge, what we call recumbent blocks, That's a fantastic wall, that one there. Big off the stats, and then it looks as though someone's just got some kind of, you know, equivalent of a paintball gun and just fired these boulders and they've just landed where they land. But that's been standing. I put that, I would put that back in the, you know, 12th, 13th century, that kind of wall. It stood all that time. And sheep look at that wall and think hmm I'm not going to try and get over that wall because it looks so flimsy the bottom wall there, there the bottom right wall there again you've got the row of orthostats these big vertical quite thin vertical stones sometimes just on one side sometimes on both sides what we call paired orthostats and then later on it's been raised in height but it's still an early wall so that's, you can see where the metre goes up to. It's what, what, 1.7, 1.8, that wall there, easily. So these are all type 1 walls. Type 2 walls are very different. They're very, very, very wide at the base, but very low. And they've got an, just an incredible shallow side. So they obviously weren't designed to keep sheep out. They were designed to keep cattle in or out. So those are the, the two you just saw there. This is the, the art thing that I pointed out on the Google Earth image earlier. 
and that line of all the stats is, is along there. Really, I mean, that's, that probably is the same date as the author stats. And then this, this wall here, there's a, what they've done is get, that, that's natural outcrop. And there's another natural outcrop there. And they've just sort of packed it in there with um, a massive recumbent block there. But these are all definitely all very early walls. And that's another of these incredible, just, just, well, I drool over these things. And that one, they've just piled up, you know, the, the effort to lever and roll and drag and, you know, the, these things into place. <coughs> Staggering. Good enough to stop cattle. I must just have a, excuse me, have a, a swig of house white. I love walls. That's the one I showed you earlier on the Google Earth image, over a metre wide at the top. And look how straight it isn't. That's another thing about early walls. The earlier the walls are, the more sinuous they are. <clears throat> Whether they were on drinking too much ale, I don't know, or whatever. But it's just a clearance. It's just basically a clearance feature. And you get up there several, which are not, it's a feature not genuinely recognised and not really very well known. They are, they're not, well that's, that's got a gate on it now at the bottom there. That one hasn't got a gate, it's blocked off. But these are examples of cattle creeps. You know what a sheep creep is? These are cattle creeps. Just wide enough for a cow to get through. And sometimes the, the side walls are like that. It's sort of fatter for the fat part of the cow and thinner at the bottom where it's just the legs to get through. These are cattle creeps. And that's one of the walls that Mr. Tennant rebuilt in the 1930s. He's just used the same stone that was there, so there's, there's still no throughs. He did an absolutely brilliant job. And I said in the wood pasture you get some standards, some big trees. This one is this ash. It's just phenomenal. If you're measuring the girth of a tree to decide if it's, if it's a veteran tree, you measure at one metre height. And... The, the girth at one metre height was about seven metres. It's absolutely phenomenal. I haven't dared go up to see whether it succumbed to ash dieback, but I hope not. A few buildings. This is um, on Oddies Lane, just down valley from Twistleton Manor Farm. It's not far off the road. It's called High Barn. Um, but the arrow is pointing to uh, Corbel's chimney. Can you see it? The fireplaces are still inside. So it wasn't a barn originally. It was a, it was a residential. And anecdotally, I've not found any proof, but anecdotally, the people down there say it was an alehouse just a very simple, what, what was called a hedge alehouse. Maybe. This is Winter Scales. That's the top of Wernside up there. That's Winter Scales Farm. There's another house hiding behind this barn there. Beautiful lime cone down there. At this building here, uh, which is ruinous, three cells. One of the cells is the necessary. Every house needs a necessary. One was probably where they kept a pig and the other one was probably a peat store. But this was not connected with that house. You can't see it on this photo, but in this field there are earthworks and this was a pub called the Burlington Thwaite. From between the um, Kirk Gate, as the road is called, and the Beck. And that house there... 
you walk past it, it's just off, it's on the right of way basically, you walk past it and you think, eh, 18th century, early 19th century. But it was last year actually, the, the owners of the house asked me, because the, the owner of the house, she's one of the top lottery people who was overseeing stories in stone. And she asked me if, uh, no, it was her husband, sorry, it was the husband. He asked me if I would go and do a survey of the house. And we did it, and they were delighted with it because I was able to tell them that at its core, that started off as either a one or a one and a half story thatched cottage. Uh, it's got a huge plinth along the front. It's got a raised roof line. It's not very clear to see on there, but the coins change. The, the wall in this, this was the parlour, the wall below the window is phenomenally thick, unbelievably thick, and it, and it sort of comes in and becomes narrow as it goes higher. That indicates it's a very early house. Um, there's the remains of, a, of a, a chimney stack on that gable, the north gable. Did I say reused timbers? Mullion, remains of mullion windows. It's a really old house, and it will go back. It will be one of the, the individual tenements of the Winter Scales Vacary. <clears throat> the farmer who owns this land now, up at Scales, calls this barn Dalbegin Barn because his father, decades ago, bought it from a chap called Dalbegin. So he just calls it Dalbegin Barn. It's on the edge of the moor. It's a typical L-shaped Ribblesdale barn. Uh, ship and door there, the, the mew door there, the forking hole there, and one, two blocked, and three blocked slit vents. A bit like those arrow slits in the castle, very narrow on the outside, but, but tapering out on the inside of the building. It's got reused timbers, reused crook timbers. It, again, it's got a, a very clear raised roof line on both sides and the gable. I've got another picture after this one. But the interesting thing about this is when I was doing all the documentary research up there, uh, I found, oh, it's the next slide, sorry. Um, raised roof line there, there's a block door there, a couple of, of slit vents there, there's a raised roof line there, a mega plinth along there. And I found this document dated 1642. It was an inventory for Leonard, Scale, Leonard Weatherhead, who'd uh, died. And this is a, a bit from it. One enclosure called Petty Garth and one house called the Overhouse. House doesn't necessarily mean a house where people live. A house, it could be a cow house. In this case, it was a cow house. So one house called the Overhouse with a parrot, there's that word, before the door on the south side of the said overhouse, adjoining to the over end of Petty Garth. There's the barn. That's the south side of the barn. This is the parrot, which is now called Garth. Garth and parrot is basically the same thing. The field, that side of this wall, is now called Petty Parrot, and the field I was standing in when I took this photo is called Petty. So this description fits that barn exactly. So it's not Dalbigging barn at all. It's actually called Overhouse. And as I said, inside there, there are reused crook timbers. So that will, that will go back, way, way back into 1500s probably. Stinted pastures. How am I doing for time, by the way? Mark, how am I doing for time? That's an hour. An hour? Good God. 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm nearly there, I hope. Um, you Sorry? You're fine. Right. You often associate stinted pastures with, with upland moors or fell sides where all the tenants of a particular manor had the right to put a certain number of, of cattle or sheep onto that pasture. They had their stint. But here in, uh, in this valley, in the Dale, there's a lot of stinted pastures which are not high up. So the scales fell is, is obviously high up and fell close is high up. But the other ones are actually quite low down. So you've got West Moss, Woofus. I cannot find the derivation of that word. Sleets, Scarclose, Thwaite. 
Thwaite and Fryer Wood, again, coming back to the wood pasture. Thwaite, a woodland clearing, Fryer Wood. And there's also another one, not on this map, Browse Pasture, Knocked Holes, Fitz, don't know what that means. Winter Scales is a high one. And there's a, a wonderful document from, I think it's 1543, which talks about sleets up there. Um, calls it Le Sleets, Le Stint, and Sutra Le Stand. So again, a wonderful mixture of, of medieval French and English. That's the map. It says up there a map of Twizleton Pasture in 1755. And you can't see it because it's too blurred, but it says on the river, the, the River Wees. And this is the scars, that scales more. This is the scars. This was Twistleton Pasture with the wall on the top which still stands and it was being subdivided there. Fortunately, it was behind, it's in private hands, it was behind glass and I could not take a photo without getting that wretched um, reflection there. Get rid of that one. Uh, and I was able to, from documents and whatnot, to work out which fields belong to which farm. High scales, low scales, middle scales, gill head, and weathercut. And if you want to read any more about all this, then there's three chapters or papers, articles there. Thank you very much. <laughs>